Well, I pray that all of you are doing well and uh, having a good time with your family and friends or wherever you might be watching from. We declare God's blessing over your life, and I pray that this word will be a blessing to you. If you have your Bibles, please turn them with me to the book of Romans, please. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Today, what I'm going to do is... Um, I'm going to teach on a subject that some of you might already be familiar with. Uh, I've definitely spoken on this and taught on this before. But one of the things that I have realized as I've been talking to individuals and families over the last few weeks is um, it's not that we don't know certain things, but as humans, even when we know certain things, we have the tendency to forget or neglect certain things. So with everything that I have to preach today, it might not be that uh, you don't know these things, but I pray that this will be a wake-up call to every single one of us. It definitely has been a wake-up call for me in, uh, as I was preparing this message, and I pray that it will be a wake-up call for you, because it's not just enough for us to know certain things. It's very important that we practice things in our lives, right? The Bible talks about not just being a hearer of the Word, but a doer of the word. It's the doers that get results. It's the doers that experience the promises of God, not just the hearers. Our hearing, hearing is very important, but our hearing has to lead us to a place of doing. Amen? Lead us to a place of doing. So when we think about life, when we think about the world, there are certain fundamental things that all of us need to understand. Even when you start off from, from the book of Genesis chapter 1, when you start reading Genesis chapter 1 and you read about the way God created the universe, God creating everything that we know in existence, the Bible says that he spoke everything into existence. Now, when you see that he spoke everything into existence, that is so far beyond anything that you and I can comprehend with our brains, that, that, that it, it almost makes God impossible to believe. But yet, the Bible also says in the book of Hebrews that we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Now, how do we understand that? He says that we understand these things by faith. See, you can know certain things logically without faith. But then in order for you to have, uh, in order for you to understand certain things in, uh, uh, about God, in order for you to understand certain things about God and how he functions, you've got to start with faith. You've got to start with faith, all right? So today what we're going to see is we're going to see how God operates and we're also going to see how we need to be operating in our lives. So the title of today's message is Just like God, just like God, all right? Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. That is God speaking to Abraham. He says, I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed God. So this was said in the presence of God. Now, the last part of that verse, verse 17, he's now going to talk something about God. He's going to describe who this God is. What kind of God is this God that Abraham uh, was made the father of many nations by? We, we're going to understand. So he says, God who gives life to the dead, right? Who gives life to the dead. Now that again, to us as human beings, that is so foreign to who we are. That is so, you know, uh, um, unimaginable, unbelievable that there is a person in existence, a being who gives life to the dead. And then he says, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. This God that you and I are talking about he is a God who gives life to the dead. And number two, he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. As though they did. So this is just how God functions. This is how he lives. This is how he exists. This is how he does things. That's why in, in uh, Genesis chapter 1, when we see the creation, we understand, oh, he was calling things that are not as though they are. 
Now, when it comes to you and me, or when it comes to human beings, the reality is we call things as though, as they are, right? We call things as they are. We name things as they are. We speak things the way they are. We don't speak things the way we want them to be, but the reality is we speak things the way they are. And to many of us, we say, well, that is just me being truthful. That is me being truthful. And the, real, the, the, the thing that we're missing is when we say things the way they are, the reality is we are not being truthful. We are actually being carnal. We're actually being carnal. And that's what I want us to understand. Foundationally, every single time you speak things just the way they are, you're not being truthful necessarily. You're actually being carnal. All right? Now, write this down if you're taking notes. You, in order for you to call things that, um, sorry, calling things that are not as though they are does not come naturally to the carnal man. So in order for us to function like God, you and I have to be intentional, right? You and I have to be intentional. Calling those things, that, calling things the way they are is not being truthful, but being carnal. Now, this is where a lot of people get stuck because they think, uh, um, it is lying. So, for example, people will say, you know, it, you know, if I'm not already experiencing it in my life, me saying that I'm experiencing it, isn't that lying? If I'm not already seeing the promises of God come to pass in my life, if I keep saying the promises of God, isn't that me lying? And I want to let you know, that is not lying, right? Lying, according to God, becomes when you say things that are not based on his word. When you start saying things that go contrary to his word, that's when you are lying before God, all right? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Verse 2. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Verse 3. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked to him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Uh, again, pay attention to what he said. He said, you shall be which means it is going to definitely happen. You shall be a father of many nations. Verse 5, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. Did you see the difference there? Did you pay attention? Again, verse 4, he said, I will... Um, sorry, and you shall be a father to many nations, right? Verse 4, he says, you shall be a father to many nations. Verse 5, for I have made you the father of many nations. So when did that happen? Because in verse 4, he said, you shall be. In verse 5, he says, for I have made you. He's not talking about the future. He's already talking about the past. So what's happening here? So in the flesh, he's saying, you shall be. The promise shall come to pass. But in verse 5, he says, I have made you, which means in the mind of God, in the heart of God, once he decides on certain things, in his mind, in his sight, it is already done. It is already done. It is not something, he is not waiting for Abraham to have his first child and then call him Abraham. See, his, his name was Abram, but he says, no longer shall you be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham. Why? Because now the assignment on his life was different. It was changed by God, right? And because it was changed, even before the manifestation ever took place, God begins to call him Abraham. Why? What is he doing there? What is he specifically doing there? Abraham was an individual who still did not have any children, but yet God is calling him Abraham, which means what? A father of many nations. So what specifically is God doing there? He is calling those things that are not as though they are. What is, what is not in the life of Abraham? He is not a father. And what is God calling him? The father of many nations. He is calling those things, him being a father, that are not 
right? As though they are, as if he is already a father. He is not a father, and yet God calls this man the father of many nations. Are you understanding that? I hope you're getting the picture, all right? Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1. See, again, in the mind of God, in the heart of God, even before you see the manifestation, it's already done. It's already done. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse, uh, sorry, chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. He says, imitate God in how many things? Everything. Everything means everything, right? In everything that we do, we ought to be imitating God. So not just when it comes to loving people, not just when it comes to forgiving people, absolutely you need to love God the way God loves uh, uh, us. Absolutely we ought to be forgiving God just as we in Christ have been forgiven by God. All of those things. But at the same time, we ought to be imitating God in everything. If he says in everything, one of the two, two attributes that we've seen about God in Romans chapter 4, verse 17 is he gives life to dead things, and then he calls those things that are not as though they were, which means we need to be doing the same thing in our life. Amen. We are children of God, and we ought to be imitating our God. We need to be imitating our Father. In other words, we ought to be living our life just like God. God. Everyone say, just like God. All right? We ought to be imitating God and living our lives just like God. Romans, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24. Look at what happens in the life of Moses. Moses. It says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? He, was, he refused. It says when he came of age, which means when he came to the understanding of his true identity, when he really understood that he was a child of Israel, when he understood that, it says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. See, every single one of us, once you become a Christian, as you grow in the things of God, there has to come a point in your life where you refuse to answer to certain names where you refuse to be called by certain names. See, when, for, for some of you, or I should say for some of us, you, we have been so identified with certain things in our lives that we are answering to those names. I guarantee you, if someone called Abraham, Abram, I guarantee you he wouldn't have answered. Why? Because it's no longer his name. When it came to Moses, when he came to, the, to, to an age where he understood what was taking place, when he understood his identity, guess what? He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What are you refusing to be called by today? Now, I'm not talking about you refusing to be called by certain things because, you know, you, you, you um, uh, uh, feel, um, you know, um, shameful by, in, in the world. No, I am talking about understanding your identity in Christ and then refusing to be called by certain things. See, for example, um, you can be unemployed for a long time and because of that, you call yourself unemployed. Some of you might be dealing with a particular sickness for a long time and because of that, you call yourself by that sickness. See, for example, people will say, I, I am a cancer patient. You understand what I'm saying? I am a cancer patient. Some people will say, I am sick. And you, you start identifying yourself with that. But there has to come a point in our lives, just like Moses refused, we, you know, failure is not your name. You've got to understand that. Yes, you might have failed in certain situations of your life, but failure is not your name. Sickness is not your name. Joblessness or being a loser is not your name. Some of you might have gone through certain hard times in your life and you might have been abused by people, but victim is not your name in Christ Jesus. Are you understanding that? Victim is not your name. Refuse to be called by that. Ugly is not your name. Condemned is not your name. Don't answer to those things. Don't answer to those things. You have to, write this down if you're taking notes, you have to both receive the right name and reject the wrong names. You have to both receive the right names 
and reject the wrong names. Joel chapter 3, please. Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. And verse 10 says this. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. He's not telling the weak that they're not weak. He's saying, let the weak say, I am strong. Again, but pastor, would that not be lying? No, it would not be lying if God says you are strong. What is a lie is what the flesh is telling you. Are you understanding that? What the, the lie is what the flesh is telling you. What God says to you is never going to be a lie. It's the mind, the will, the emotions, the, the, the five physical senses and the world that tells you the lies. And you have to refuse those lies and believe the truth. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 10 says this, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Again, this is an instruction that is being given to us. Now, if this is an instruction that is being given to us, and if the word of God is telling us, even when you're weak, let the weak say, I am strong, then guess what? There is a principle that is at play behind this. If we don't understand the principles by which the world is operating, the way God created this world and the laws by which this world operates, you can have the best of intentions and yet not see the results that you want to see in your life. Amen. So what we need to understand is um, when you are weak and suffering, don't start or, or don't keep talking about what you are currently experiencing. Here's the key. Start saying and start declaring what you want to experience. Start saying and declaring what you want to start experiencing in your life. Now, every single one of you that, that, that are going through certain situations in your life and you don't want to continue to experience the same things, even in prayer, don't keep repeating and saying and talking about the same situations, the same sad stories, the same struggles over and over and over again. That is not going to help you in any way, shape, or form, my friends. You and I, we are called to speak things or call things that are not in existence as though they are. In other words, when God came on the scene, when God was on the scene and before creation ever began, when he wanted light, he did not look at the darkness and say, it is really dark and I wish there was some light. See, a lot of us, we look at our circumstances and say, I am really sick and I wish I can be healthy. That's what we say. What, what we are saying is, I, you know, we continue to describe the effects of the curse in our life, rather than declare the, the, the promises and the blessing of the Lord upon our lives. I remember the story of a, of an, a this was actually a pastor. A pastor was diagnosed with uh, um, the, the cancer of the stomach, the stomach cancer. And, and I mean, he was, uh, the doctors have given up all hope. He was on the deathbed and uh, things were looking really bleak and things were looking really bad. And while all of this was going on, you know, the people around him were talking about all the uh, negative things that he's experiencing in the body. And another pastor uh, friend of his was called to visit him. And so the pastor friend goes to visit him. And as he goes to visit him, he gets to the hospital, he goes to the place, and he's, this, this man is on the bed. And so he goes right next to him. And, and at this point, the man is barely able to speak. I mean, he's barely whispering. He, he, he can barely get a word out of his mouth. And, and any time he tries to eat something, I mean, the, 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 the system or, or the body just doesn't respond in the right, uh, right way, and he ends up throwing up everything that he uh, takes in. That's the kind of condition this man is in. And so this pastor goes, 
and he sits next to him and uh, he opens the word of God, he opens the Bible and he just starts talking to him. He starts saying, hey, you, you, you understand this is what the word of the Lord says. You understand this is the promise of God. You understand that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And he preaches to him and encourages him for a few minutes. And after he says all of these things, then he says, you know, I know you're feeling weak, but I want you to declare out of your mouth that you are strong. Right? I want you to declare out of your mouth that you are strong. And this pastor who is on the bed, who is suffering with stomach cancer, who, who is barely able to say anything. I mean, you need to really uh, get your ear next to his mouth to even hear anything that he is saying at this point. And in that condition, in that situation, that pastor with stomach cancer begins to slowly, barely whisper out of his mouth. I am strong in the Lord. I am strong in the Lord. I am strong in the Lord. And he makes him say that over and over and over again. He, give, he begins to make him confess other things in the word of God, who he is in Christ Jesus. And he begins to declare, everything I eat sits well with my body. Everything I eat sits well with my body in Jesus' name. He kept saying that over and over again. And the pastor was right next to him, encouraging him. 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, the voice kept getting better and better. 30 minutes later, he by himself was able to sit upright in his his bed. Now, guess what happened? They continued to do that. Now, he instructed the family members. He said, don't speak anything and don't have him speak anything negative out of his mouth. Don't talk about the present situation. Start declaring how you see him, how you want to see him. If you want to see him coming out of the bed, eating the food that he needs to eat and having a healthy stomach and doing the things that he needs to do as a normal human being, he said, start declaring those things out of his mouth. The amazing thing is the pastor leaves, the pastor prays, blesses him and leaves and goes back to wherever he came from. And the, and the, and the, the testimony is few weeks later, they continued the process over and over and over again, every single day, declaring the word of the Lord. And guess what? That man completely got restored. God restored him completely to 100% health, completely free of cancer, completely freed from every kind of, uh, um, you know, sickness and disease. And when went back to preaching the word of God and continued to live his life. Now, the, the, the amazing thing is that, that the, the other pastor was able to come at the right time and be a blessing to this man. But if they continued on the same uh, um, uh, path that they were going in, the testimony would have never taken place. Why? Because they were going in a direction where they were continuing to declare things the way they are. If you continue to declare the things the way they are, they're never going to change in your life. Now, this can happen to every single one of us, and this happens very subtly. Sometimes, because of the way we're experiencing life, for example, there are parents who will say, my kids are just crazy. My kids are just disobedient. I've got crazy kids. I've got crazy kids. I've got disobedient kids. I've got kids that will never study. They will never pass an exam. And guess what's happening? Even though that's not what you want to see, no, no parent desires for that for their children. And yet, out of frustration about, based on the things that we are experiencing in our lives, we continue to decree and declare these things. And guess what? Those things continue to come to pass in their life. So you, you, you know, set up a tuition teacher, you do all the things, you send them to the best school, and guess what? Even after setting up the right tuition teacher, even after setting up, sending them to a different school or the best school and doing all of those things, they are still not succeeding in their life. Why? Because there are certain things that are being declared over their lives. Sometimes even when it comes to our relationships, maybe your marriage relationship, maybe your spouse, and you look at your spouse and you keep saying, you know, my spouse just doesn't care for me. My wife doesn't care for me. My husband doesn't care for me. Yes, you might feel in a particular instance or a particular day that, the, that your husband does not care for you or because the way your wife treated you or did not treat you, you might feel like she doesn't care for you. But that's not your desire. 
That's not the way you want, to, you, you want your marriage to continue. So if you want your marriage to be where your wife truly cares for you and your wife truly loves you or your husband truly cares for you, guess what? You need to start changing what you say out of your mouth. You need to start calling things that are not as though they are. See, that's how God does things, and that's how we ought to be living our Christian life as well. This is a principle in the kingdom of God. This is a principle of living by faith in the kingdom of God. So if you want your life to turn around, if you want your husband or, or, or the marriage situation to turn around, start declaring out of your mouth that my husband loves me, my husband is crazy about me, my husband cares for me. Start saying the same thing about your wife. My wife loves me, my wife cares for me. We have a great marriage. Our marriage is getting better day by day. It gets better and better and better. We love each other more than we've ever loved ourselves. When you think about your kids, declare the word of God over your kids. Let them know that they're made in the image of God, that they're beautiful daughters, that you've got handsome sons, that they have the mind of Christ, the wisdom of God is within them, that they function to the perfection God created them to function, that they will follow in the footsteps of God, that they will accomplish everything that God has called them to accomplish in their life, even if they're acting a fool right now. Are you understanding that? Even if, even if, I'm not saying say these lovely things about your wife when she does everything perfectly. I'm not saying say these things about your kids or your husband when they do everything perfectly. My friend, you've got to say those things even if everything's going in the opposite direction. When it comes to your finances, don't, don't, you know, don't say, I, I never have enough money. I never have enough money. Oh, I can't buy this. I can't buy that. Why? Well, I, I, I never have enough money. See, some of you, here's the reality. When it comes to your finances, you have called yourself certain things and let the world call you cheap. You've let the world and the people around you call you poor. See, sometimes when, for example, let's say there are a bunch of friends, and every single time you go out, there's, there's that one guy, there's that one girl, there, there, there are those people who you say, that guy will never give. That guy will never spend for this. That guy, you know, all of you are trying to pull your money together to go on a trip or to go to a restaurant. Or, oh, that guy's never going to give. That guy's never. Go and you've heard that and you're comfortable with that. And you let them, let that name become your identity. And what is that identity? I'll never have enough money. Someone always has to pay for my ticket. Someone always has to pay for my food. Someone always has to pay for my clothes. And you have gotten yourself comfortable in that position. And guess what? That's not of God, and yet you are called by that. And every single time that name is being called out, you answer that. You answer that call. You've gotten complacent. You've gotten comfortable in that place, that place of never having enough. And you think it's okay. And the reality is, it is not okay. For example, some people uh, 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 will believe in the fact that nobody loves them. Nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. You, you sit down, you start talking, and all they have to say. And they've believed that for such a long time that, that every single time they sit with someone, that's all they have to talk about. Nobody treats me the right way. Nobody says, the, uh, you know, hello to me. Nobody says this. Nobody says that. Nobody respects me. Nobody loves me. And yet the Bible says, if that's not what you want to see in your life, stop saying that. You know, I've had to watch this in my own life, even as I was preparing this message, you know, over the last few uh, uh, months and, well, I guess, uh, you know, ever since starting the church, there are always certain needs in the church, always certain repairs and certain things that we need to buy and certain things that we need to keep improving. And, and, and as this was happening over the last few uh, weeks and months especially, we've had to make so many uh, uh, upgrades in the church. And even as we're thinking about expanding and reopening and, you know, because our space is very small and we're, we're having to uh, uh, think about plans of moving to a larger venue and larger place and all of these things. And, and even as I sit with the team and they they talk to me and say, Pastor or Anna, we need to buy this or we need to buy that. And my default notion or my default answer is, yeah, but wait till we get the money. Or, or, or I started saying, we don't have the money for that right now. 
We don't have the money. Again, that's not what I, where I want to be. And yet, even though I knew this principle, even though this, I knew this is the way God operates, I neglected that in my life. And even as I was preparing for this, I was convicted and it became an alarm for me. And I said, man, I, I, you know, I've been messing this up. Again, I'm the pastor, so I need to take responsibility. So I said, oh, wait a minute. I said, God, forgive me for this. Forgive me for this. Lord, I don't want to be in a place where we don't have enough. I want to be in a place where there is abundance for all that you've called us to do. And so I needed to start changing what I say. Every one of us needs to remember this. Every one of us needs to judge ourselves. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1 and starting from verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God of our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Again, I'll read from verse 3 to, to verse 11, and I want you to pay attention to the tense that is being used. All right? So verse 3. It says, Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, which means this is something that is already done. Now, some of you might think, but I need the blessing of God. I need to be blessed spiritually, pastor. I need to grow. I need to, I need to receive a blessing of the Lord in my life. And yet the Bible says that he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Not some, but every spiritual blessing, which means what? Even if you don't feel that, even if you don't experience that, just like Abraham did not feel like he was a father. Abraham did not see a son walking around. He did not see daughters walking around. He did not hear the sound of children that were his own for a long time. And yet God calls him Abraham. He says, you are the father of many nations. And you might say, well, pastor, I don't feel any spiritual gifts on the inside of me. I don't feel spiritually blessed. Guess what? It has nothing to do with your feelings. It has everything to do with what God has already said. And he says he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Every. Well, pastor, I, I, I just believed in Jesus last week. You've got every spiritual blessing. But pastor, I've been uh, uh, saved for a hundred years. You've got every spiritual blessing too. Everyone in Christ Jesus has been given every spiritual blessing. Verse, verse 4, it says, sorry, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Guess what? You might be saying, nobody chooses me. I'm the last person to be picked on the team. Even when I think about my childhood, when they were dividing teams on the sports ground in my team, I was the last guy. Nobody wanted me on my team. And yet the Bible says, God chose you. It doesn't matter if your boss didn't choose you. It doesn't matter even if your family decided not to choose you for certain things. David was not chosen by his father, and yet God chose David. God chose David, my friend. And guess what? Some of you that are watching right now, you feel like the last person on the playground. Both teams, everyone is chosen, and yet you're the joker who's left out. And that doesn't feel too good. And you might be hurting, but I want you to know, you are chosen by God. Some of you young people, you fall in love with certain people and you decide, oh, that's the girl, oh, that's the guy, and, and you choose them, but they don't choose you back. And you think the world has come to an end. In some cases, you let the devil convince you so much that you think because a girl, you think because one boy, one individual did not choose you back, that your life is good for nothing. You are convinced and you've let the enemy convince you because one individual did not choose you back, that your life is not worth living. Some of you are in depression right now because, exactly because someone did not choose you. And yet the Bible says that in Christ, God chose you. You're chosen by God. Look at what it says in verse um, 5. It says, having predestined us to adoption as the sons by Jesus Christ to himself, he predestined you. 
He not only chose you, he predestined you to be his son, to be his daughter. And then it goes on to say, in verse 6, he says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. He made you. He didn't look at you and say, "Mm, let me see if he's acceptable before me. No, he said, "Even, even in the worst condition, when he's unacceptable, when she is unacceptable, when her past says she's unacceptable, when his decisions let me know that he's unacceptable, I will make them acceptable. He made you acceptable in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins. You've already been redeemed. You've already been redeemed. Verse 8, which he made uh, to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Again, uh, he's talking about the riches of his grace. He made it abound towards us. He will not do this in the future. He already did this in the past. Verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Again, I don't know the will of God. I don't know the will of God. The will of God is always a mystery to me. And I, I never understand God's will. I never understand God's will. And he says, he made it known to you. How? Through his word, through Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection. He made his will known to you according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Purposed. Again, past tense. Verse, uh, let's just jump down to verse 11. In whom, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. Obtained an inheritance. Again, why am I telling you all of these things? The reason why I'm telling you all of these things is, even after reading all of these things, many of you have this sense or notion, but that's not true of me. But that's not true of my life. And guess what? Even though this is the reality of where we are in Christ Jesus, we go back to the reality of where we are in this physical world, in this present world. And we forget the reality of where we are in the spirit. And guess what? Because you rely on where you are in the flesh, you continue to speak, you continue to declare the things according to the world, the things according to people, the things according to the enemy. And as you speak them, some of you knowingly, some of you unknowingly, and some of you because you neglected certain things, neglected the truths and the principles of God, you are declaring things and you are decreeing things upon your life the way they are and not the way they need to be. The way they are and not the way they need to be. You you want certain things to change and yet you keep saying the same thing. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Verse, uh, go, go with me to Colossians, and we'll, we'll quickly wind this down. Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1, in verses 12 and 14. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. Who qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance, past tense. He's not going to do this in, in the future. He already qualified you to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. Here are four things that I want you to write down based on these two verses. Four things that I want you to write down. We are qualified for the inheritance. We are qualified for the inheritance. So every single time, you think about certain things in your life, make sure that your words are being filtered through this truth. You are qualified. God has qualified you. So don't ever say that you are unqualified to do the things that God has called you to. Don't ever say that you are unqualified to do the things that God has already qualified you for. So you can look at your degrees or lack thereof No degrees, no education, and say, I'm unqualified. No. See, the moment you say you are unqualified, you are declaring that over your life. And you might say, no, I'm just being truthful, pastor. I don't have a certificate. It doesn't matter. God did not qualify you because of his certificate. Are you understanding that? So now what you need to do is you need to declare out of your mouth that you are called, or sorry, you are qualified by God. Why? Because that's the truth. That's the truth. 
Are you understanding that? There are many examples and even testimonies of people who got promotions and jobs into places they did not have any qualification for. Any qualification for. In fact, my first job that I, when I became a, a youth leader and a pastor in the U.S., I had no qualifications to be a youth pastor. None whatsoever. I was a terrible leader. If you think I'm bad now, I was terrible back then. I was terrible. I did not even know what an agenda was for a meeting. I, the first time I had a meeting, I, you know, after they told me that I was going to be the leader, I said, okay, we need to have a meeting. Or, or actually, I didn't even say we need to have a meeting. They said, you need to have a meeting. And guess what? I said, okay, let's have a meeting. And we had a meeting. And the, the first lady that walked in and she said, hey, Ben, what's the, what's the agenda for today? And I had no answer for her. Why? Because I didn't even know what an agenda was. I did not even know that we needed to have an agenda to have a meeting. That's how bad I was. And yet, God qualified me. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Number two, we are delivered from the power of darkness. We are delivered from the power of darkness, which means that you don't have to be under the bondage of the work of the enemy. Some of you keep saying, I'm addicted to alcohol. I'm addicted to alcohol. I'm addicted to smoking. I'm addicted to pornography. I'm addicted to being angry. You know, I just can't help it. I'm, you know, I just get angry. I just get angry. I just get angry. And you keep saying that over and over again, like it's some kind of mantra. You, you, you keep saying, you, you, you've, you've let the world give you a name that says you're addicted to pornography. There's nothing that you can do to come out of the chains of pornography. I'm addicted to alcohol. I'm addicted to alcohol. And you keep saying that. Or you might not say addicted, you say, I can't stop drinking. I can't stop drinking. I can't so what who said that? Who like are you a slave? Are you a slave? Because here he clearly says that you have been delivered verse 13 Colossians 1:13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. If he has delivered you from the power of darkness, why do you keep saying that you can't do something? When he says you can. And how many of you Know that famous scripture for, from Philippians, chapter 4. I can do how many things? All things. See, we, 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 there are certain scriptures in the Bible that have just become famous. We, we see them on calendars. We put them as wallpapers, desktop wallpapers, you know, cell phone wallpapers. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. But I can't stop drinking. Right? But I can't stop drinking. I can't stop getting angry. Why? Simply because you've believed the lie of the enemy and you've convinced yourself. You've let that label take a hold of your life. Again, remember, what, what, what does the Bible say about Moses? He said, when he came of age, he refused to be called a son of the daughter of Pharaoh. What do you need to refuse to be called by in your life? And what is it that you need to start calling in your life? See, when you call things, they respond to you. That's the way this universe has been built. You call things, they respond. There's a level of authority that God has given to the born-again child of God. You have a certain level of authority. See, when I go to my parents' house, when I, when I call upon the dog's name, he answers. He comes. Why? Because I have that place. The dog knows when my name is called, I run to that direction. In the same way, in the realm of the spirit, there are things that are waiting for you to call. But they will never respond. They will never come into your life unless you call. Are you understanding that? Unless you declare, unless you call, there are certain things in your life that you will never receive or experience and there are certain things that you need to be refused to be called by simply refuse he says he has delivered you from the power of the enemy therefore you are delivered you are delivered number three 
It says in verse uh, uh, 14, he says, we have redemption through his blood. So number three is, we are redeemed through his blood. You are redeemed. You are no longer under the bondage or in prison to the enemy. The price has been paid. Jesus paid the price and you are redeemed. There's nothing that the enemy can force you to do. You are redeemed. Redeemed from what? Redeemed from the curse and everything that comes as a result of the curse. Which means you're redeemed from sickness, my friend. That's right. Every single one of you that's watching right now, you are redeemed from sickness. There is absolutely no need or necessity for a child of God to suffer in sickness. Again, we, uh, the example that I gave you, he, that man was a pastor with stomach cancer. And the cancer was eating away his body and squeezing the life out of him. But when another pastor came by, this is the, the reason why you need to be surrounded by godly men and godly women. And not just so-called quote-unquote Christians. You need a person that will speak and deliver the word of God to you. Not just tell you Bible stories. And what happened? Because that man came and started whispering in his ear. He said, declare the word of the Lord. Let the weak say, I am strong. And he started declaring, whispering, I am strong. I am strong. I am strong. And guess what? Even if that's all you can do, start there. I'm telling you, that whisper can bring the breakthroughs in your life. Again, I told you, let this be an alarm for you. It is for me. Let this remind you that you don't have to be where you are. Some of you are just praying and begging and begging. No, start declaring certain things. Start declaring certain things. Again, let me also say this. You don't have to be poor. Just like you don't have to be sick, you don't have to be poor. The wisdom of God has been made available to you. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit is made available to you. The, the, you can start speaking to God. You can start speaking in tongues. The mysteries will be made known to you. You will know exactly what you need to do. Start a business, find employment, whatever it is. You don't have to be broke and poor. You don't have to always be stretching out your hand in, in, to, to, to borrow something from someone. If you, as a child of God, stretch your hand, make sure that most of the time you are stretching your hand to give to bless someone not asking someone again i'm not saying it is wrong to ask i'm not saying it is sin to ask there's nothing wrong with that but to stay in the same place weeks and months and years later is a sign of the curse and not the blessing is a sign of the curse and not the blessing. There's nothing wrong. Again, please don't take this in a twisted way. I am not saying that it is wrong to ask someone for help. There's nothing wrong. There is nobody on the planet that can live their entire life without asking or taking or receiving the help of somebody else. There's none. But to remain there, to always ask for a blessing and never be a blessing, that's not the place that God has for you. You're redeemed from that place. All right? Number four, we are forgiven by his blood. We are forgiven by his blood. That's the truth. That's the reality, which means you no longer have to be in guilt, shame, or condemnation. Whatever you have done, it is okay. It is done away with. I'm not, I'm not making excuses for your wrong behavior. I'm not making excuses for the sin that you've committed to others and to God. But what I am saying is, there is a time where you receive the forgiveness, where you repent before God, receive the forgiveness of sin, and from that point onward say, De devil, I have made a mistake, but I am not a mistake. I have sinned, but I'm no longer a sinner. I have done those things, but I no longer do those things. And now you walk free from the guilt, shame, and condemnation of the past, and now you understand that you are completely, totally, 100% forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And you declare that out of your mouth. Start declaring that you are the righteousness of God. You're no longer an addicted sinner. You're no longer a fool making foolish decisions. You, are the, you have the wisdom of God. You're a child of God. Start declaring that out of your mouth. Again, look at what it says 
in Romans 4.17, going back to the foundational scripture, the last part, it says, um, God who gives life to the dead. Now, that's a very important thing. Why? Because the more you begin to declare the word, the more you begin to speak the word out of your mouth. Here's what's going to happen. Remember that, that, that testimony of that pastor with, with stomach cancer? He started whispering and whispering. It got louder and louder and louder. But there came a point where there was a quickening in his body. See, there comes a point in your life. The first couple of times you might say, you know, I'm really addicted to pornography. I keep watching. Or I'm really addicted to alcohol. I can't go to a party and refuse alcohol. I can't go to my friend's place and, and come out of that place without having a drink. I'm addicted to this thing. But then every single time you say, I'm no longer addicted. I'm an overcomer in Christ Jesus. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You start declaring that. You start declaring that. First couple of times you might feel like, man, I'm just lying. I'm just, this is not true of me. And you might feel that way. But if you keep declaring, keep declaring, keep declaring. There comes a point where there is a quickening that takes place. A quickening, the Bible says. Here he says he gives life to the dead. Those things that where, where you feel like there is no life, all of a sudden, the life of God comes in. Again, he says, God who gives life to the dead. Who is God but the Word? The Word gives life to the dead. When you, out of your mouth, declare the word of God, guess what? You are speaking and declaring things. And even those things which seem dead and gone, life will come, once again come out of those things. Some of you, you might feel like those relationships, your marriage or your, uh, uh, you know, whatever seems dead. I'm asking and I'm asking and I'm asking and I'm imploring every single one of you, start speaking life. Start speaking life. And as you speak the word of God, there will be a quickening. And those things which seem to be dead and gone will once again come back to life. They will come back to life. Amen. Amen. Uh, First uh, Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, and I'll end with this. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, he who, sorry, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. You were healed. Past tense. For every single one of you that is either sick or knows someone in your family that is sick, Start encouraging them to speak things the way they want to be, not the way they are. Stop saying that you are sick. Stop saying that you are a patient. Now, sometimes people listen to a sermon like this and say, okay, you you know, the doctor said I have COVID. Um, Should I even tell the pastor I have COVID? Or should I even tell my wife I have COVID? Or like, just by you saying I have this doesn't change everything. You can come and tell your wife or tell your pastor or tell your spouse, tell your children, tell your parents and say, hey, this is what the doctor said. No problem. You can even say, this is how I, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing pain in my body. No problem. You can say, I'm experiencing pain in my body, I'm experiencing headache, but I just want you to pray with me and come to faith with me and and pray for, uh, believe with me for healing right now. No problem. See, we've gotten used to talking a certain way. We we, 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 We don't even know how to express what is happening in our bodies without identifying with it. So rather than saying, the, the, the doctor believes I have cancer, we say, I have cancer. You understand what I'm saying? You say, I have cancer. You say, I am a cancer patient. What, what, what's happening? You're identifying with it. Don't identify with the things of the world. Identify yourself with the things of Christ Jesus. Identify yourself with the things of the Spirit that have been declared and decreed and done over your life by Christ Jesus. Amen?
Amen. I pray that this is, it, it, you know, has brought certain things in your life. I believe the Holy Spirit has reminded you and brought things into your remembrance of where you need to start making changes when it comes to the words that you speak. It is time that we start imitating God, my friends. We are children of God, and we ought to be imitating God in everything that we do in our life. When you look at your marriage, when you look at your family, start calling your family blessed. Start calling your body healed. Start calling your finances abundant. Start calling your relationships peaceful. Start calling yourself the righteousness of God. Start calling yourself as made in the image of God. Start calling yourself forgiven by God. Why? Because that's really the truth. You need to start calling those things that are not as though they are. Are. Why? Because that's the way God wants you to live. That's the way he lives, and that's the way he wants you to operate as well. Amen? Let me pray for you at this time. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach your word. I pray, Father, that revelation knowledge has flown freely. I pray, Father, that those word that has fallen, I declare, Father, that it has fallen on good ground, and it will bring forth a mighty harvest in the lives of your precious people. I declare healing. I declare uh, uh, an abundance, Father. I declare uh, restoration of family relationships as well. Everywhere there is hurt and pain, I declare and decree healing and joy. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Well, my friends, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate every single one of you, as always. If you have a prayer request, please reach out to us. The number is on the screen. Uh, you can reach, us, uh, reach out even on social media. We are here to pray for you and be a blessing to you. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, we'll see you again next time. Be blessed.